Okay, while well, the last uh, few people uh, drop in, um, we'd like uh, to start uh, for, uh, with today's uh, Alexander von Humboldt lecture. Uh, first of all, of course, uh, welcome uh, to this last Alexander von Humboldt lecture in this series on making European spaces. Welcome also to our special guest for tonight, Professor Rudolf Stichweg from the University of Lucerne in Switzerland. Um, in our series, up to now, we uh, had several contributions, each addressing another aspect of making European spaces. We started off with uh, Professor Stuart Eldon, um, who did not talk so much about Europe, but presented a genealogy of territoriality. And territoriality is, of course, a very basic aspect of uh, making spaces and making European spaces. In his story, um, we also heard um, a lot about the power mechanisms uh, behind the different conceptualizations of territoriality. And we continued our series with a contribution by um, Luisa Bialashevitz about the way we deal with the external border of the European Union. Again, power and ideology played an important role in her story. Um, and of course, the relationship with the non-European parts of this world. So this was very much also a story about um, an external uh, relational concept of the European Union. This was then followed by a talk of uh, Simin Davudi, who related the internal spatial structure, structuration of the European Union with different conceptualizations of European identity. Thus starting uh, that in uh, stating that uh, in this uh, respect there is much more at stake than just the physical spatial structures uh, and that these structurations are to a large degree the result of identity politics. This also immediately led us to the fourth contribution, namely the, um, the one of Michael Wintle, on the history and politics of visualizing European identities from Enlightenment until now. And to complete this picture, it would be necessary to go uh, into much more detail um, of the processes and mechanisms um, which structure European space and organize uh, the ways we relate um, to the other or to the stranger in a way which frames um, them not just as the result of power relations. And at this point, the contribution of Professor Stichway comes in, um, taking the inclusion or exclusion of migrants or strangers as an example for such a mechanism um, as there are probably also many more of the same kind. There could be many uh, reasons to invite Professor Rudolf Stichway uh, for an Alexander von Humboldt lecture here in Nijmegen. Professor uh, Stichway is an expert on the historic development of universities, in which uh, the brother of uh, Alexander von Humboldt, William von Humboldt, also played a very decisive role. Um, I'm thinking here of uh, Professor Stichway's book on science, university and professions from 1994, but also many um, more uh, later publications in this field. Professor Stichway um, not only has a lot of expertise uh, in this field, he also uh, has um, a lot of practical experience as a former dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences at the University of Bielefeld, from 1999 to 2001, but also as rector of the University of Lucerne uh, in the last uh, four years. And many more administrative positions in different organizations. Especially in the dynamic Dutch university landscape, this field of expertise um, is always uh, of great interest <coughs> and uh, uh, would also uh, be a valid reason to invite uh, someone here um, for uh, Alexander von Humboldt lecture. A second reason 
why we could have invited uh, him is because he, has, uh, he is also an expert on the theory of social systems. A theoretical framework which uh, is also of use um, for us in our own field of research. Um, especially also in the more policy-oriented kind of research taking place uh, at our department. For example, in this uh, policy-related field, uh, complexity theory is at the moment uh, a hot issue. Professor Stigway um, became a professor of sociology in 1994 as direct successor of um, the great uh, systems theoretician Niklas Luhmann at the University of Bielefeld, uh, and he has developed uh, further this field of knowledge since then. A field of knowledge which uh, some time ago was qualified by a, a former administrator of our faculty as too difficult for us. Uh, when I uh, dared to ask a question about Luhmann at the PhD defense. Well, uh, on the one side, this shows that Professor Stichwe's expertise is uh, more than welcome uh, here. Uh, and on the other side, um, this uh, might also help us uh, to take um, our role as a real university uh, more serious, in such a way that we self-confidently can say that no questions are too difficult for us. Finally, and for today most importantly, Professor Stichwe is an expert in the field of um, the theory of world society. In the framework of this research, he described uh, different forms of societal structurations which actually lead to the establishment of such a world society, and which partly might also uh, be a part of the process of Europeanization, of the establishment of a European society. As part of this research, um, we also have to mention his basic interest in the processes of inclusion and exclusion. So many, many reasons to invite uh, Professor Stigwe here and uh, to be very happy to have him here today uh, and the next few days. Uh, so let us not uh, wait any longer and uh, give the floor to Professor Stigwe with his lecture on European spaces, the inclusion and exclusion of strangers. For you. Yeah, thank you very much for this friendly introduction and for the invitation. I'm glad to be here and um, to say some things, some words today on two connected subjects. I want to speak about the question how does Europe, in the processes of its constitution, understand or describe itself what is the idea uh, of Europe? Europe develops in becoming a social cultural entity. And, and then, how are these processes? of the self-definition of Europe connected to the problem of strangers, how to deal with them, how to include them, how to exclude them. Uh, these are the two subjects I want to deal with in, in my talk. And what I'm going to say has mainly three, three parts. It's first about strangers, kind of slightly general introduction on what the concept of stranger means in social science. Then Europe, constitution of Europe as a social cultural space in a historical perspective but looking to our present time. And then third and last point, present day Europe and its, its strangers. I start with strangers in human social systems. I want to make the point at the beginning that the idea, the concept of the stranger belongs 
to uh, the social semantics which are of nearly universal import. That means you find such a semantics of the stranger in, as much as I know, any social system about which we know something. If you look at the social system at its self-descriptions and semantics, you normally will find concepts and role definitions or definitions of dealing with strangers. And this, these semantics of the stranger have to do with the experience of meeting others, meeting others which for us are somehow surprising, unexpecting, unexpected, even irritating others, others which we did not expect to meet in the way we get to know them. And when this happens, social systems uh, conceive a need to do something about this problem. A stranger is something who in his or her otherness is not completely unproblematical for a social system, but about whom some Participants, at least, think there something has to be done about it. That means, if I introduce it in this way, it means you have to make a clear-cut distinction of otherness and strangerhood. Otherness is a very universal uh, social phenomenon. Each of us is another one to all the others in this <coughs> in these rooms. That's, in some respects, a problem too, something, but a very routinized problem, which we are used to deal with every day and in every situation and interaction we are going through. But strangerhood is a more specific situation, a more specific problem. We experience a certain irritation in getting to know, in meeting someone whom we call a stranger, and then some special solutions have to be looked for, and some special <coughs> roles have to be identified to, to get along with a stranger. I, I will only say so much that in looking at the history of social systems, and of course it's a very long history, many thousands of years, I think in a very uh, a little bit risky simplification, I will propose to say that there are exactly five ways of dealing with a stranger you can identify in social systems. There is a certain evolutionary logic to these five ways, but not a strict sequence. You will find many of them in different periods of history, but nevertheless there is a certain, say, let's call it this way, evolutionary logic to it. And I only present it in a very brief way, because it's only in an introductory way I do this. It's not my main subject here. First, possibility you meet a stranger but do not even perceive him or her to be a stranger. That is often to be observed in tribal societies that a stranger arrives and persons who meet him are sure that's an ancestor recently or, the, or for, for a long time deceased but now he's back again and we know exactly who he is. Or say, Latin American societies in meeting Spanish uh, explorers or soldiers often thought, often had a place for them in their cosmology. They knew it was this God and we have expected him and he will do good things for us and uh, when he didn't do good things they were surprised and that was an important moment in history as we all know. That means there are societies who have a closed world picture 
in some respects, which doesn't allow them uh, at their risk to identify and to perceive strangers when they meet them. Then, perhaps much more uh, to, to be observed nearly everywhere and a more universal mechanism, societies perceive strangerhood, they attribute it, but all their mechanisms are oriented to make it go away. They kill strangers, that's a very elementary, very often to be observed way of dealing with strangers in many societies over thousands of years. You can kill them. Or another very uh, often to be observed mechanisms, if they cannot make them go away or if they cannot or do not want to kill them, you can adopt them. You, for example, prisoners in war. Uh, which you do not kill perhaps because they are strong or young or whatever, have some capabilities, you adopt them to your families. And after there are some rituals, there is probably a chief involved, but after some time he's a normal member of your family. You do no longer perceive him as a stranger. That means there are many mechanisms for dealing with strangerhood in a way that it disappears after a short time. Therefore, it loses its irritating quality. Third, perhaps the most universal way of dealing with strangers in the stratified social systems we have, have observed now for thousands of years, you find a place for him or for her. You find a role. An American sociologist called this status gaps. There always are status gaps in societies, places which you cannot fill with the personal you have. Sometimes it's even the place of the monarch. It's, there may be such an amount of conflict in a society that you have to take the monarch or the king from outside. Even this position is often given to strangers and you can go through a whole hierarchy of a society and uh, which, in, in which very different positions are often filled with strangers and uh, that's a very functional way of dealing with them, identifying gaps or status gaps or uh, dealing with taboos, things which are not allowed to uh, do for my own people, therefore I have to find a stranger who has to do these dirty things. Uh, and uh, that's a very uh, mechanism very often to be observed in historical society. And then there are fur two further forms. And that's, uh, that are the forms which are, as much as I see, perhaps most interesting for us today, because I might call them the modern forms, and uh, I think they, both of them are only a, a few hundred years old. Both of them arise nearly at the same point in time and they coexist today. The first of them, that means the fourth in my classification, is tied to the modern nation state, which is uh, which m much more than earlier uh, types of the formation of social systems is based on is normally based on a very simple binary classification. You are either a citizen of my country, a national, someone who belongs to my country, or you are not. And that only two possibilities are given. You may, under certain circumstances, switch from the one side of the distinction to the other side, but it's a clear-cut distinction. And only in our days, this clear-cut character loses something of its dominance and significance. But it's still present, and I will come back to it later. But there is one other mode which is as prominent as this one, and perhaps still more prominent, and which in some respects one could say is still more modern. Because we do not only live in a society which consists from national states who operate with these 
binary classifications of persons belonging to it or not belonging to it. But we also live in a functionally differentiated world society in which most of our uh, actions and communications is not related to the national state. But most of our actions and communications is related to certain functional domains of social action and communication. We go to a law court and have some business to do there, then it's law what is relevant and many other social relevances are not so important. We can go to a church and pray or do whatever one can do in a church. We go to a university and of course the university is characterized by processes of learning and research for which aspects of nationality are not very relevant in many respects. Uh, it's always uh, universal knowledge, world knowledge, which is processed in universities and in being there, uh, national belongingness is not so important at the end. And you can repeat this argument for all the function systems uh, of modern society, but in describing society in this way, strangerhood is somehow invisible. In the, take the case of the university. A, a student coming from Taiwan is not a stranger in a university, but he is a student of geography or physics, and he knows his matter and contributes, or he does, knows his matter not so well and may have some problems. But aspects of strangerhood are very much pushed aside in communications uh, conceived in, in this way of functional, specific communications. And that's a way of processing communications and actions in modern society, which in some respects may be described as the end of strangerhood. If, I, I, that's not the only reality which exists, but there where it exists and where it becomes dominant, we have a certain invisibility of strangerhood. This becomes this, this is not so long and so important in communication. It's only rarely a subject in communication. I, for example, you know, I teach in a Swiss university and sometimes we have a meeting and then it may happen that some of us says, is there a Swiss person among us? And often there is no Swiss person among us, although it's a Swiss. And then we may laugh and then we go on and go to our normal, normal business. So much to my <coughs> first point, strangers in human social systems. And uh, in some respects, you will see, I come back and will make use of some of these points I made in this kind of classificatory approach to the evolution of strangerhood in social systems. I come to my second point, <coughs> constitution of Europe as a social, cultural space. And what I want to postulate is that from its beginnings, Europe is and always was closely related to the concept and the semantics of stranger, of the strangerhood. Namely, Europe that is easily to be perceived in its processes of constitution, of the genesis of a social cultural entity we could call Europe, Europe results from the integration of migrants into the social structures of the Roman Empire. First, there is a Roman Empire, and of course it's not a European Empire, it would be nonsense to call it such, and it never had such a self-understanding. And then, in the final centuries of the Roman Empire, you have these processes of mingling, of intermeshing of Roman populations. And of course, this self-understanding of being a Roman did not end with the end of the Roman Empire, even in 8th, 9th century, 9th century Europe. You find many persons who say, I'm Romans, although they are not of Rome, but they identify themselves in this tradition of being of Roman descent, uh, 
But besides Romans, <coughs> there are many populations, say Lombards or Langobardi, Franks, Germans, and many other populations whom the Romans called barbarians, who often called themselves barbarians. And by this identification, it's obviously said they are strangers. But now they are here, and they live in those territorial spaces we today call Europe. And from uh, the intermingling of these populations, Europe arises, although the world is not there. Of course, it's there in a, in a geographical sense, in the sense it's old, but it's not there in the way of self-describing a social system or a social cultural space. We have such words I just mentioned, barbarian. It's not so pejoratively meant as it was in Greek times. It's much weaker, therefore it's an apt uh, term for self-descriptions. It means sometimes non-Christian, barbarians are not yet Christians. It sometimes means soldiers. Many of these populations were very military populations. It often means things as simplicity. But uh, what arises is a at the end of the Roman Empire a kind of positive connotation of having a simple culture, of speaking a simple language. And therefore, this culture of simplicity is somehow related to the concept of barbarian and is in this way uh, introduced in the genesis of Europe. And there is, <coughs> and, and that's an interesting term from the history of the terms of strangerhood, there is this remarkable institution which you observe in, in many territories in Europe that the Roman population has to give some land property to the migrants, that they have to share property with them. Often it's a third of their land property they have to give to them. And this remarkable institution, which you observe from the 6th century for, for somehow earlier at some places too, <clears throat> this remarkable institution of sharing land property with migrants often is called hospitalitas. That is a, a term is made use of which belongs in the history of terms of strangerhood. Hospitalitas means being a host to some others who are my guests for which I for whom I have to care, to whom I have to give something. And uh, giving land to migrants is a kind of hospitalitas and uh, the others are conceived as my guests and from these institutions grow new social systems <coughs> which in some respects are at the beginning of Europe. And it's in this context uh, as much as I, I know, that we hear for the first time the word Europeans, the Europeans. I, I'm, of course, you never know with terms when it really was used the first time, but uh, for example, the very, still very interesting book by Dennis Hay, Europe, the History of an Idea, 1957, he, he did very good research as much as I see, and the first use he, he found was in, 70, uh, sorry, sorry, in 732 after the Battle of Tours. And that's indeed a very important event, this Battle of Tours in which a very mixed army of Franks and Germans and Romans and other populations which was led by the Frankish military leader Karl Martel defeated an Islamic army and pushed them back. And there is a uh, chronist who described this battle of Tours who is co called Isidor Pazensis. And this chronic, he says, he, he, without any antecedents, he calls this army Europeensis. And I think it's remarkable that it was a fight against an Islamic army 
that somehow motivated the first usage of this term, if it is rightly identified. I'm never sure in such things, but it's a significant usage anyway, and therefore interesting. Afterwards, that's 732. And then now, uh, as, uh, I, as I have not so much time, I, I, I shorten my way to, uh, through European history and say afterwards, for nearly a thousand years, the word Europe in pointing to a social cultural entity was only rarely used. You do not find, you, of course, you always have the term in a geographical sense, but in pointing to a kind of social system, you rarely find it in the 8th, 9th century and so on. And the, pr probably the most important reason is that the dominant term was Christianitas, or Respublica Christiana, the Christian Republic. And that means the barbarians have become Christians. Meanwhile, Europe uh, calls itself Christianitas or Respublica Christiana. And in opting for this term, it articulates a claim that it is an entity, at least a potential entity, with a much, which reaches much farther than uh, into the geographical space of Europe. It claims to be a kind of belief system of religion which is relevant for the whole world. And that's perhaps the reason for this term Christianitas or Respublica uh, being the dominant term because it uh, articulates the claim that this belief system is not restricted to the geographical unit of Europe but is of much further, much farther import. And uh, what happens? And what happens in early modern Europe? That this dominance of the term Christianitas becomes somehow unstable. And I think one reason why uh, the claim coupled to Christianitas is not so sure of itself is that Europe realizes that the claims uh, which are articulated by this self-designation are somehow unsuccessful. Because if you look at real spread of belief systems, there is not so much Christianity uh, on other continents of the earth. I will only illustrate this by one quote from an important author from the early 17th century, Samuel Purchase. He became famous for arranging travel descriptions from many explorers, therefore he was much read in the 17th century. And there is an interesting passage in one of these, these books, which, uh, at which I will only look for a short moment. Purchase says, I, I, I quote, is taught the way to scale heaven not by mathematical principles. Later on that may change, but at this point of time that's probably true. It's taught the way to heaven not by mathematical principles, but by divine verity. Jesus Christ is their way, their truth, their life. But now it becomes interesting for us. Jesus Christ, who has long given a bill of divorce to ingrateful Asia, where he was born, he has given a bill of divorce to Asia, and Africa, the place of his flight and refuge, and is become almost wholly and only European. You see, an author as Purchase realizes that in reality, Christians are nearly only in Europe. And I finish the quote, for little do we find of this name in Asia, less in Africa, and nothing at all in America, but later European gleanings. Of course, there were some 
Christian missionaries, even in early 17th century, who go from Europe to spread Christianity again. But first of all, we have to realize now, 1600 years after the birth of Christ, there are only Christians in Europe. It was this global claim of Christianity was wholly unsuccessful. And what, what begins at exactly the same time in which Christianity or Christianitas has to realize that it's a much smaller social system than it thought until this point of time, what begins is a kind of secularization of the self-understanding of Europe. And, uh, and you find it in many authors, and you find it, of course, parallel and even before purchase. I will only mention Machiavelli, who is a very interesting author for this. He has a strong concept of Europe, too, but uh, his descriptors are wholly different. Europe is a continent where there are more good soldiers than on any other continent. And why are there more good soldiers? Because there are more republics and there are more monarchies, Bo both of them, more republics and more monarchies. And that means there is sufficient training ground for good soldiers because there are so many republics and so many monarchies and they have to fight and they can fight for different republics and or monarchies and that trains in, that, in them that, uh, uh, that property which he estimates especially, it trains virtu or virtue. It, it, uh, it trains this kind of virtue which makes a real man who, is, who acts from strong moral principle and that's Europe. It's, uh, it's uh, characterized by virtues, it's characterized by the action capability of individuals who may switch between the different European social systems. And what you already have in, in Machia Machiavelli, or beginning in Machiavelli, is this understanding which says Europe means a plurality of social systems and their compatibility. They are not only many social systems, but they are connected among one another. Even if they fight with one another, I can today fight for this one and perhaps tomorrow for another one. And of course, even that is a way of, of transferring habits, of transferring traditions, of transferring virtue between the different European republics and monarchies. I will only cite one other interesting example from a wholly different author and a wholly different field of social action. Uh, Leibniz, late 17th, early 18th century, devised plans for academic institutions his whole life. He always made these plans. Most of them uh, were never published, were never sent to uh, to somebody because he made so many of them and he had so many to do. And one of these plans for, for an academy uh, devised by him and written in uh, and found in manuscript after his death has a remarkable dedication. Leibniz, after having finished it, signed it by writing on the, pa on the top of the paper at monarchiam qui volat, volet. That means to that monarch who wants it. And that's European. You make such an academy plan, you are not sure that your monarch is interested in it, but you know there are many of them. And if mine doesn't buy it, some other one will buy it. As you know, Christopher Columbus uh, approached five Euro European monarchs until he finally found one who gave him ships. And again, we have the same understanding, the same self-description of Europe. You have many possibilities, but a space of reduced social contingencies. What you cannot do here, perhaps you can do at another place in Europe. I will only mention some other 
descriptions and self-descriptions of Europe to be found at the end of uh, the early modern period. If you look at the 18th century, it's very standard to say Europe is one republic, not a plurality, but one republic. But it's a republic, a respublica consisting from many states, some of them republics, most of them monarchies, but the interrelatedness of these states in itself is of course not a monarchy, but a republic. And this understanding of describing Europe as a republic consisting from many states, you find, for example, in Voltaire, you find it in Gibbon, you find it in Frederick II, and many other contemporaries. Or another description, uh, interesting as much as I see, is to say Europe is a very public space in which whatever you think and conceive is public because it's published via printing. That's again something which Europe thought is specific to Europe and not to the other. It was not entirely right, but it described itself in this way. It's a public space in which whatever thought you have and whatever idea you want to present is made very public by printing. But on the other hand, it's a very private space but the, because these ideas and thoughts are uh, approached by persons who want to get to know them in a very private study, in sitting at home, in a study, in reading these books. It has, it's a very public space but it has a very private way of educating persons, of educating individuals. And that's, none, again, one of these self-descriptions of Europe, being one public space which forms very individuals because it forms them in a very private way of study. And uh, this self-understanding of Europe is, as I see it, formulated in a very apt way in a final quote or near to final quote I want to show you, which is written uh, exactly near to the end of the period I, at which I'm going to, to look in this, in this talk. It's, it's, a, it's a formulation by Edmund Burke, that famous British conservative theorist and historian. He was both. And, uh, and that famous critic of the French Revolution or of the excesses of the French Revolution. But it's a very remarkable passage in one of the writings of Edmund Burke in which he describes the interconnectedness and the similarities arising on the basis of interconnectedness in the different European spaces and he concludes, and that's the quote I, I wanted to show you, he concludes, no citizen of Europe could be altogether an exile in any part of it. Wherever you go, you will never be an exile. You will never really be a stranger because you somehow know, you, of course you know not everything, but you somehow know the cultural climate you will get to know when you go to another European space. I go on with a quote. When a man traveled or resided for health, for pleasure, for business or necessity from his own country, he never felt himself quite abroad. I'm not sure if this was true, but it's a remarkable description of a social cultural space in which strangerhood is already somehow weakened because it's a pluralist space, but it's a space of reduced social contingency. And um, uh, there is one more uh, understanding which I want to mention briefly, which is exactly contemporaneous to uh, this formulation by Edmund Burke. It's, for example, an understanding I find in a in a German uh, author and educated who was famous in his days. He, he's not so 
well known to, today. His name is Karl Gottlieb Suarez. He was a Prussian official. He uh, was the educator of the crown prince of the Prussian monarchy. Many of the important intellectuals of late modern Europe were, among other things, private educators of, of, uh, of the sons, sometimes daughters, of monarchs. And in these teachings, Suarez gives to the Prussian crown prince, he develops a very remarkable uh, idea which is shared with some other German authors of these days. Suarez says, it is, there is, there exists a law of nations, what we still have today, a law of nations. He says there is a natural law of nation, and this natural law of nation says that every state in the world is always allowed to deny any stranger the access to his territory. That's the natural law of nations, as Suarez formulates it. But then he adds, that's not all what can be said, what we can observe in our day, that additionally to this natural law of nations, you find the European law of nations. And this really exists and really can be observed in operation in present day uh, Europe, so at least Suarez postulates, and it says no, to no European stranger may be denied the access to another terri territory in Europe. He makes exceptions, for example, for enemies in war, but in principle he maintains this specific version of the law of nation which does not allow the denial of access to a European stranger in European territories. Immanuel Kant somehow made the same point. He already tested it as a, as a, as a basic understanding of a world citizen law. He said if a world citizen law is going to arise, and in Kant it was more meant in a utopian way, it will mean that every citizen of the world will have the right to go to any place in the world and to offer himself or herself to the others for mutual commerce. That is the Kantian idea, very famous and uh, uh, still somehow an, a utopian idea in the law of nations. I will, with this, conclude the second part of my argument, Europe arising as a social cultural space on the basis of strangers and strangerhood and integration of populations who were strangers towards one another, Europe which from this uh, brought about a social cultural unity which for a thousand years was described as a social cultural unity of Christianitas, and then in the early modern period, uh, discovering plurality and interconnectedness and, and reduced social uh, contingency and complementarity as its real basic social structure, and therefore inventing for itself a uh, a way of dealing with strangers which said in Europe you will never really be a stranger to any other person you meet. And uh, I would say one could, and that somehow means to go already into the 19th century, one of the remarkable symbols uh, of this uh, European acceptance of strangerhood perhaps was that the other religion with which Europe never made its peace in the early modern period, I don't mean Islam, but I may mean the Jewish religion, that this uh, process somehow seemed to take another course in the integration and uh, emancipation 
of Jewry in the 18th and 19th century Europe that was a kind of symbol for this process of integrating strangerhood in another way in, a, in the self-understanding of Europe, that Jews were no longer forced to live in enclosed and separated <coughs> spaces, but somehow became normal members of European society. And uh, at least in the early 19th century. I come to my third part, Europe, present-day Europe and its stranger. And in some respects I want to, to of course, uh, I, I want immediately to go to the present-day situation, but I have perhaps to make some remarks on the time between, a, say, 1800 and, uh, and the second half of the 20th century. If you look at Europe and its strangers, say from 1870 to, 19, to 2010, you may distinguish three periods of European uh, history. Uh, I only say it in a tentative, approximative way, but I, I, I would propose to test this description of the history of Europe in the last 150 years. You have, first of all, the period from, say, 1870 to 1914, before the First World War, which some historians call the first globalization, the beginnings of world society. And in looking at Europe in this 45 years, it was a very expensive social cultural space, which you may describe by two tendencies. Europe was an emigration continent in this period. There were many countries in Europe some of them very poor, especially in Northern Europe, who did not have any immigration, but which were in, in an enormous amount emigration countries. They lost or they sent outside millions of Europeans to new territories on other continents of the world. That means Europe was an emigration continent and at the same time, and that was somehow part of this process, it was in another way, an expansive continent, it was a continent of colonial expansion. <coughs> the Euro European continental colonial empire had its by far the biggest extension in this period, uh, before the beginning of the First World War. France and England were never bigger than around 1910. And as you all know, the colonial for example, occupation of Africa in, in principle only happened in these la last 25 years before the First World War. That is, we have to do with a very expansive Europe. But then we have a completely different period from 1914 to 1945, which one could call the self-destruction of Europe. You have the war which destroyed much of Europe and killed many people. You have an interlude, say 1990, 19 to 1933, which you could call an interlude without peace. Europe never succeeded to find stable foundations for a peace between uh, the nations who had fought against one another in the First World War, and then you have the World War II and the final destruction, you could say, of much of, of Europe, and of course the elimination of the most, or the planned elimination, and in many respects successful elimination, of the most significant population of non-Christian strangers Europe ever had known, namely the European Jewry. Therefore, that's a, a remarkable, a catastrophical period of European history, and from this arises the world in which, which we live now. Uh, 
and in which one would say Europe has a completely different, a completely no, new uh, place in the world. It's a much smaller social entity in the world. And this process begins, one could say, in 1945, but one could also say it begins in 1960, because uh, between 1945 and 1960, it's still a period of, of, of uh, working on the consequences of the period of self-destruction. On uh, it's mainly a, a period of decolonization. Around in 1945, many European countries still hold to the idea of having colonial empires, and only in 1960 this is finished. Last colonial uh, possessions are become independent, and Europe is more focused on the small space in which it lives now, which now becomes identical with the geographical space uh, of Europe. And it's this last period at which I uh, want to look for a short time. That's the last thing I want to do. And I want to come back to the question, how does this new Europe of the last 50 years in which we still live now and will live for a, a significant, uh, as long as we can look into the future, how does this Europe of, from 1960 to 2010 deal with its strangers? And how does it uh, understand and uh, uh, behave toward its strangers, which are now, as long as I look at Europe as a Europe of nations, there were under understandings, and I pointed to them at the beginning of my talk. But when I look at Europe as a Europe of nations, how does it deal with its strangers? And uh, that's a complex topic, and the, 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 what I want to do in the time left for me is to look at some results from empirical social research. That makes it more simple, but perhaps it gives a, a somehow clearer impression at uh, Europe and its strangers in present-day society. I look for, at, for some results, at some results from uh, the European Social Survey. Everything I say now is somehow related to studies done on the European Social Survey. That's a big survey project uh, realized in 2003 for the last time. And I first show you a table from that, one of these studies. It's from the American Sociological Review, 2008. The author is, is Bale. And what is interesting in this table that you see 21 European countries, that are the countries who participated <laughs> in the European Social Survey, and the net migration they realized between 1960 to 2000. And what you see, the numbers are percentage uh, of net migration as share of the population of the respective country. That means if, for example, uh, if you look at Portugal, that's the most easy number, in, from 1960 to 1970, it lost every year 1.39% to uh, migration. And you can read the other numbers in the same way. And what you see from this table, and that's the only point I want to make, you see difference, differences are significant. There are some countries who in these 40 years have decade for decade a very significant migration. Take, of course, the Netherlands. It's small numbers, but continuous number. And it's a continuous number of, uh, of uh, a net migration which 
adds immigrants to the population of Netherlands. There are some countries with, with, with a far bigger immigration, take Luxembourg or Switzerland. And <coughs> there is one other point which I want to make. In the first two to three decades of this period, you still have a number of European countries which are emigration countries. That means from 1960 to 1980, and sometimes to 1960 and 1990, many European countries are emigration countries, some European countries are immigration countries, but there, is still, uh, there are still these differences. When you look at the last uh, row of the table, 1990 to 2000, you see nearly all the European countries are immigration countries. That's a significant shift in European history in the last 50 years, which continues in these days and which will probably continue in, in the ongoing time. Second, uh, I will again only look briefly at this table, primarily at the left. You see in this left row, which is uh, subscribed total, you see the share of immigrants in the population of these 21 European countries. And you see how significant the differences are. There is this extreme case of Luxembourg, where 40% of uh, the population are immigrants. That means immigrants not born in Luxembourg. You have Switzerland with 20%. You have then a significant number of countries which are between 8 and 10% of immigrant share of their population. But you have, on the other hand, some European countries in which the share of immigrants is very small. Take Finland or Italy or Poland or even, even Spain. Again, significant differences in the European situation. Uh, I, I do not look at the continents, but uh, what you can easily see in looking at these numbers, that there are only few countries who have significant populations from far distant continents. Netherlands are among it. It's the only country who has a significant immigration from East Asia and the only country which has a significant immigration from the Caribbean. Again, there are very interesting differences between the European countries. But now, and that's the last thing I want to, to do today, look for explanations and for explanations of differences in dealing with strangers, differences between different European countries. I have, I hope one can, yeah, that's okay. Uh, that's uh, one other study, study done on the basis of the European social survey. There are, again, in this case, 22 countries because Israel participated in the European Social Survey, but uh, it's remarkable that this happens, but of course in some respects it's not really European. Uh, you have these countries and uh, people were asked how much would you like to have immigrants in your country and from which other countries would you like to have these immigrants? That is, the numbers uh, tell us two things. How much inhabitants of the respective country want to have immigrants? For example, Hungary, if you look at the numbers, that are the lowest numbers. That means Hungary is that European country in 2003 in which people say, in, in principle, have a very uh, limited, uh, a very acceptance for having immigrants in their, in their country. Hungary is, is a very 
uh, is a case in which this tolerance for immigrants is a, on a very low level. Greece is another good candidate, or Portugal. And there are other countries in which you have very high numbers. Again, Netherlands is among them, Switzerland, and uh, all the Scandinavian countries, and so on. And uh, uh, this study from which I uh, quote here had one other question, and I will briefly uh, uh, tell you the main results from this study. It asked, these, this acceptance of strangers and the different willingness of inhabitants of the country to deal with strangers, to which other social variables is it related? And the results, I cannot demonstrate it in tables because they would be too complicated. These results are very remarkable. What is to be seen in this study, which has been published in international organization in 2007, in all European countries that you can say from this, see from this table, in all European countries, Europeans are preferred to non-Europeans. In most countries, you can see this in these numbers too, inhabitants prefer immigrants from richer countries in comparison to immigrants from poorer countries. But there is one remarkable exception, or some remarkable exceptions. This preference from immigrants from richer country is not to be observed in the case of Sweden, of Netherlands, of Norway, and of Switzerland. And that's a remarkable population of countries to which I come back. And then there is one other robust result in this study, which I can only mention mentioned here and which I cannot demonstrate with number. If uh, the authors of this study looked for explanatory variables uh, behind this tolerance, behind this willingness of acceptance of strangers, and in all results it's, it's only one variable which is really strong, That's, that is education. People uh, the author started with a hypothesis that tolerance has to do with economic competition between uh, uh, inhabitants of the country and foreigners. But there are no indicators which, which point to this hypothesis. Instead, you see in all the data that tolerance towards strangers, willingness to accept strangers, is very clearly related to, to education. Uh, people with higher education always favor immigrants regardless of the questions where immigrants come from. And this uh, correlation of education and tolerance towards strangers is uh, once more clearly related to the level of education you got. If you look at schools and if you look at years of schooling people had, this tolerance somehow progresses from year to year. If you add one year of schooling, say someone has not nine, but ten years of schooling, there is a slight progression in tolerance for strangers. But if you go uh, to university people, you really change to another level. There is really a jump to a significantly higher level of tolerance for strangers. That's one interesting result from this European social survey. And there is one last result, and which I want to present because it somehow uh, allows an interesting uh, view of the contemporary European landscape and the differentiation in the contemporary European landscape. That is a study related to six questions which were part of this European social, social survey. All people who were asked were asked uh, for their willingness to accept 
strangers and they were asked to detail somehow the conditions they expect from a prospective immigrant. Do they expect him or her to be white, to come <coughs> from a Christian background, to speak one of the languages of the country, to be committed to the way of life of the country, do they expect the immigrant to have good educational qualifications, and do they expect him or her to have work skills useful for the country? There was always a scale from zero to ten, and you could, the persons asked could place their answer for all of these six questions somewhere on this scale from zero to ten, and then you can observe differences between social cultural strata, but what you can observe too are differences between countries. And these differences between countries are very interesting, and therefore it's the last thing I uh, want to show you, because it somehow allows a view of the European landscape in our day is. This is, I have to explain it, it has been, uh, uh, it's a kind of analysis which has been done by a method which I will, not, can, will and cannot explain here, fuzzy mem membership scores, and we get three groups of countries. And this building of groups of countries is done on the basis of the answers, inhabitants of these countries, and there were no immigrants about. The immigrants were taken out of the analysis. It's only persons who were born in these countries. And if you ask them these six questions, you can, by the answer given to these six questions, build three groups of countries in present-day Europe. There is this group uh, above, on, on the top, which goes from Hungary, Greece to Spain. And if you look at this group, uh, you have a remarkable tendency. Inhabitants in these countries look very much, or at least, much stronger than average inhabitants from other countries to the question of the immigrant is white and if he or she comes from a Christian background. That means racial and religious points of view are uh, represented in the answers of the inhabitants of uh, these countries uh, with uh, a significant bigger strength than, in, uh, than it's true for the inhabitants of the other, other countries. That is, here people look to racial points of view, they look more to the question of Christian background, and the other questions, does the immigrant speak one of the language? Does, is the immigrant committed to the way of life are not so important as they are in the other countries. That's the first group. And I think it's a group with a remarkable profile. All these countries are somehow on the fringes of Europe. All these countries un uh, for a long time were emigration countries and not immigration countries. All these countries have a relatively low uh, populations of strangers and all these countries only recently became immigration countries. You could say it's a kind of group which bases immigration of, on primordial criteria of belonging, of membership. Primordial criteria such <coughs> as race and religion. There is a second group. That's the group on the right. And uh, again, uh, what I find remarkable uh, is the similarity 
in the answer tendencies of uh, the inhabitants of these countries. In all of these countries, the question of race is someone white, and the question of religion is someone a Christian, is uh, in interest the inhabitants much less than, the, than it's, it interests the average European. In all of these countries, the question of language, does the immigrant speak a language of the country, and the question uh, of cultural affinity, does the immigrant accept the life form of the country, is much more important than it is in the first uh, group of countries, and the inhabitants of these countries look somehow more to educational qualifications of the immigrants. You could call this second group of countries, I would propose, it's very much a group of uh, attitudes which prefers a kind of integration of strangers which you could call functional integration. They have to speak a language, they have to accept culture, they have to be somehow educated. We accept strangers, we do not postulate primordial conditions, but there has to be a certain functionality to it. And then there is a third group, which uh, is uh, once more, I as much as I see a very remarkable constellation. It's a small group, only four countries. And again, all of them somehow on the fringes of Europe, but other fringes than in the first group. And what you find in the answers of the inhabitants of these four countries, in all six dimensions, they are much weaker than all the other countries. That means they do not look so much, at least compared to other Europeans, they do not look so much at race, at religion, not even at language or at, uh, at uh, cultural affinity. We seem to have to do here with a small cluster of countries which do not prefer functional integration but which seem to opt for a more flexible inclusion of strangers, which may be related to ideology or to cultural heterogeneity of these countries. It's not easily to be said. And the analysis from Bale in the American Sociological Review, from which I take this, doesn't give a clear answer, and I think one has to look for it. For us, it's only to demonstrate, and uh, this... European space in which we live today and to project it to the history of Europe and to look at these differentiated landscape of very different attitudes and conditions and preferences which inhabitants of the respective European countries postulate for, if, if I may say it in this way, as conditions for inclusions as conditions for membership. Of course, one should have to compare this to non-European constellations too, but in the first approximation, it's, I find it very interesting as a European picture too. I've spoken too long and I finish here. Thank you very much for your for patience. Yeah.